So that was the best weekend of the season. Let's talk about it. Colby, hit it. You are Locked On Mariners, your daily Seattle Mariners podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ahoy, sailors. It is Monday, August 12th, 2024. This is Tiny Gonzalez and Colby Patnode for the Locked On Mariners podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So we're pushing the mailbag to tomorrow because we have a ton to talk about, as is from this past weekend series against the Mets. But before we give you our biggest takeaways from that, shout out to our title sponsor today, Supply House. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to get parts fast. Shop for your next plumbing, HVAC, or electrical job and get fast shipping from coast to coast at supplyhouse.com. And if you want to hear from me and Colby even more and help support the show, check out our Patreon. The link is in the description and you can sign up for a free seven day trial so it seems like that Mitch Hanniger walk off against the Tigers might have uh, fixed the vibes a little bit for this team because they went on to not just sweep the New York Mets this weekend utterly dominated them they outscored them 22 to 1 over the course of this series and Colby you were there for the final two games of the series in person you got to see it all unfold before your eyes tell us about it yeah, it it was uh, it was a great weekend. You know, obviously, could have been even better if the Red Sox had helped out at all. Uh, but uh, you know, so it goes. Uh, it just so happens the Mariners have won four in a row, right in line with the Astros winning five in a row. And, and you know, that's how baseball works sometimes. Uh, but you know, you did pick up a, three games on Boston. You've leapfrogged them in the in the wild card, and uh, you know, you're the first team out in the wild card now. So it's possible that another Avenue to the postseason may have opened up for you over this last weekend, but uh, obviously, you know, all eyes are on the division uh, going forward, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a great weekend. We saw some, you know, pretty good offense, especially yesterday. We saw some timely hitting uh, in the first two games. And then we just saw just utterly dominant pitching uh, all weekend. This is, I think this is the third time in Mariners history. They've given up one run uh, in a, in a three game set. Uh, total they've never shut a team out three games in a row apparently uh, but uh, they came pretty darn close it was a Jeff McNeil solo homer uh, that that prevented that from happening and you know Luis Castillo goes out there yesterday he goes six innings right gives up just four hits strikes out nine allows just four hard hit balls and somehow he had the worst start of anybody yeah. who threw ball this weekend like it's a pretty good run and you know it, it was uh it it reminded me of the that mid April run where just like everybody was was shoving and even like Emerson Hancock is going like six scoreless somehow and you're just like wow like this rotation when they get on a roll they can really you know you know shut you down and uh you know yeah. again the Mets are a pretty good lineup pretty good team uh, I mean they were arguably the hottest lineup in baseball heading into the series and the best record in baseball since June one I think yeah uh, something like that so. Yeah, they were playing very good ball, and and you weren't, uh, to be you know to be honest about it. You weren't. You needed a kind of a fluky, you know, walk off single uh, from Hanniger uh, to avoid being swept by Detroit. Uh, so, yeah. but uh, yeah, that's baseball, man. Turns on a dime. Uh, you get really good pitching. You're there's not a lot of pressure on the offense, and and then go figure. Uh, the offense just randomly explodes for twelve runs on Sunday night baseball, the first game. On ESPN in Seattle since 2004. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it all really worked out very nicely. But uh, to me, this weekend, the story this weekend starts uh, with the starting pitching. Uh, it was simply uh, sensational from all three guys. So obviously for us watching at home, this was a bit of a different experience with Sunday Night Baseball with the ESPN broadcast with Victor Robles being mic'd up, which was incredible. I don't know if you've seen the clips of that yet. Uh, but him laughing maniacally as Jorge Polanco rounds the bases after hitting that solo home run in the in the second inning was the best, just the absolute best. Victor Robles continues to endear himself to this fan base. But um, did it feel any different inside the ballpark with it being Sunday Night Baseball? Was there like a different energy in the ballpark at all? No, not really. Um you know, they, they made a thing of it before uh, the game. Hey, we're on ESPN. They're coming live to us, blah, blah, blah. Let's make some noise mm -hmm. uh, and all that stuff. But, 
No, I, I wouldn't say there was a really a different energy. Um, it's kind of a weird four o'clock start time. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it was it was a good crowd. Uh, certainly there was energy in the ballpark, but I, I don't think it was significantly different from Saturday, at least, in, in, you know, from where I was sitting. So, uh, no, it was just a good, solid crowd. And, and uh, they didn't really, like, make too big of a deal of it. It wasn't like... Like they did a little pregame, like, "Hey, here's the, uh, you know, first time in 20 years." And then they, in the second inning, I think they they showed the broadcast booth and all that, and mm-hmm. uh, and then that was pretty much it. I mean, my camera threw out the first pitch. Uh, yep. That was pretty cool. Uh, I got the crowd going with the with the trident. So, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, so there's a which little that's bit a little action. bit different to have someone right. like speak to the crowd before the game. I think that was specifically because it was Sunday night baseball. Uh, yeah. but, uh, yeah, other than that, no, it was, you know, they still did all the same promos for the most part and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, ballpark operations ran exactly like they would. So, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say there was a, a huge difference. Uh, but obviously, you know, you sat in that ballpark when it's, well, you haven't, but you sit, you sit, yeah. you sit in that ballpark when the team's not playing well and they're just swinging and missing a lot. And then you sit in it when like, Good things are happening like obviously the the vibes are fantastic when uh when good things are happening in that ballpark so mm-hmm. uh yeah it, it was it was fun atmosphere uh didn't feel like anybody was like super amped because it was sunday night baseball or anything like that mm-hmm. uh but uh yeah it was it was fun and uh you know crowd brought it uh when it needed to and uh there was there was a good vibe uh all the way around and i i think you know part of it the fact that they had already won the series also kind of played it a part in it. It's like, yeah, I mean, obviously we want the sweep, but like we beat a good team, you know, we took two or three from them at the least. And now we're just kind of going out here where you got Castillo on the mound. We're just going to kind of vibe and, and see what happens. And boom, 12 runs later, uh, you, yeah. you, you get the sweep. And I love the the decision to where the city connects on a, on a rare mm-hmm. Sunday instance. Uh, with the you know obviously the special occasion of Sunday night baseball, uh, but I thought that was just a great display of, of obviously Mariners baseball. Of course, that might be the the best game they played all year, but also just a great display of of the fans of the atmosphere in T-Mobile Park in Seattle. Uh, hopefully, that shows ESPN like, hey, bring your product up north a, a little bit more than you do. You know, maybe maybe get it off the East Coast a little bit more than than you do. So be nice to yeah. be on, on Sunday night baseball again. Cause uh, one seems like the players really like doing it. <laughs> and, uh, and two, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's a lot of fun seeing, you know, some new things that you don't really see with this team. Like again, guys getting mic'd up again, Victor Robles was electric yesterday during his little sure. segment. Yeah. He was amazing. You, you got to go back and watch that. It was awesome. All right. So let's, uh, let's dive into this pitching a little bit more, but first a reminder, this episode of the locked on Maris podcast is brought to you by Supply House. Get supplies from the site that's made for the skilled trade, supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical products online. Their easy-to-use website is packed with helpful resources and the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts from over 400 top brands and get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry leading service from the friendliest folks in the business and talk to a real person every time pros in the skilled trades can get a competitive edge by joining supplyhouse.com's free trade master program every trade master gets access to a dedicated phone line free shipping and discounts on every order join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com tm and order plumbing hvac and electrical supplies from anywhere with just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com and you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Tomorrow you can catch all the action between the Mariners and the Tigers on the Mariners hometown broadcast with SiriusXM via the SXM app. All you have to do to find that is search the word Mariners. Hopefully that series goes a little bit better than the last Tiger series this team played. Uh, all right, so the Mariners dominated the Mets offensively. They dominated them defensively. Uh, Jorge Polanco suddenly became a gold glover out of nowhere in the series. Yeah. Uh, the Mariners turned one of the greatest double plays you'll you'll see. Uh, Randy Arozarena barely missed uh, Victor Robles's knee and made an incredible catch yesterday, which was terrifying, but also 
awesome at the same time. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, but really where the domination in the series starts is with this pitching staff for the Mariners. Uh, Bryce Miller, Logan Gilbert, Luis Castillo shoved. And that might be an understatement. They were ridiculous this series. Now they have 73 quality starts on the year, which is insane. It's August 12th. We had talked about the potential of this pitching staff and how good it could be. Are Do you think we're actually approaching like one of the greatest rotations of all time in a while, at least like that kind of status with this rotation, given the era that they're pitching in too? I mean, I, the mid nineties, which is, you know, heart of the steroid era yeah. at the Braves with Maddox and Glavin and Smoltz and, uh, who was even the fourth guy, uh, Denny Nagel, I want to say, uh, like Mike Hampton, I think was a part of it for a minute. So like, yeah, uh, there's been some great pitching staffs, uh, but, uh, you know, the Mariners, uh, certainly they're up there. Uh, they are, um, you know, one through five, they are electric and on any given night, any one of those guys can just absolutely dominate a really good lineup. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's probably still a few more, a few too many inconsistencies to call them like an all time great. I, I think, you know, they don't miss a ton of bats. So uh, there's not a, a ton of strikeouts in this rotation. Uh, but yeah, like one through five, just the ability to just go kind of go right after guys and, and not walk people, something that all of them are really good at. Uh, it, it's certainly up there. And I mean, I don't think you could make an argument for any other uh, rotation in Mariners history. Uh, you know, it probably doesn't have, it, I mean, there's no Randy Johnson uh, in this rotation, but you know, there's like, Five, I mean, it, I don't, there's not quite Felix, but they're closer to Felix than people want to admit. So, like, there's like five, like, legitimate, you know, all star quality arms in this rotation at any given time. And if they're all throwing the ball really well, like, you might only score one or two runs, you know, in an entire series. So, uh, it, it's one of those things where I don't know if it's one of the all time greats yet. I don't know how, you know, stacks up statistically. And obviously, you know, pitching in this era it's better than it's ever been but also home runs are up you know there's a lot more home runs there's a lot more emphasis on you know hitting the ball hard and, and all that stuff so uh you know era statistically speaking it, it, it's they're kind of tough to compare eras but uh yeah this is certainly one of the uh best pitching staffs you know probably since the turn of the century uh rotation uh and it is pretty i, I would say pretty easily uh, the scariest rotation uh, in in certainly the American League, at least, uh, and possibly in baseball uh, for for this year. It is just, you know, you get five righties. They all kind of do it a little bit differently, but there's some similarities. And and you on like you said on a night in night out basis, you don't know, you know, you you're liable to go, you know, to get shut out over seven uh, on any given night. And and so, uh, yeah, it is. Simply put, but it is the, the best uh, rotation in Mariners history. I don't think it's really up for debate uh, oh, yeah. in that regard. And, uh, you know, and that's, you know, there's been some good rotations in Mariners history. I mean, we had, we had Felix and Iwakuma both in their prime at the same time. You had mm -hmm. Randy Johnson anchoring a staff for a decade. You had Felix Hernandez anchoring a staff for a decade. You had, you know, the 2001 team had, you had Jamie Moyer and you had Freddie Garcia. And like you had Freddie. some of these, you know, these guys having big years mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, but, no, it's, it's consistent. Uh, it's, there's upside play here. There's bouts of domination, not just surviving. Uh, this is a, a very good rotation. And uh, I, I would say it's the best in, in baseball uh, right now, which is pretty obvious uh, in terms of, is it, you know, statistically one of the best, I don't know how you compare eras and all that stuff, but uh, yeah, it certainly is right now the best rotation uh, in baseball. Right. Right. Because it's also not just about what's at the top end of this rotation. It's also like your number four and number five or number twos and threes in some rotations, right? Mm -hmm. Like even in a bad rotation, Bryce Miller might be a number one for a couple of teams out there. Like the depth in this rotation is ridiculous, one through five. And then you got a couple of Cy Young candidates, like legitimate Cy Young candidates this year in Kirby and, and Logan. Uh, you have guys that are just kind of like, right on the outside looking in and in Castillo and, and, and Bryce 
Wu has been an elite strike thrower, and we've talked about how insane his underlying number, numbers are, considering the fact that he's really only exclusively throwing fastballs, the 2% barrel rate, the ninth lowest hard hit rate against in the league. Like this rotation is, it's so dynamic, it's so diverse in the styles that they throw at you. And they're so young too, right? So it's like, even, you know, so in the case of like Brian Wu, that's someone that probably has another gear or two. So we might not even be seeing the best out of some of these guys, which is terrifying for the rest of the league. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's certainly more to go get uh, for a couple of these guys, uh, you know, and, and obviously Wu the last couple of times out, he's gone deep in games, which has kind of been the last little step for him is to, you know, throw 90 pitches, go six, seven innings. Uh, and he's done that. And, and, you know, he's done it all still with pretty much just the two fastballs. Uh, so uh, there's still a lot to go get from Wu. Miller certainly is, uh, you know, a little more polished at this stage, a couple more offerings uh, than Wu does, but uh, Wu's fastballs are great. And, and Miller is uh, like very quietly almost putting together a sensational second season, uh, you know, uh, yeah, he just kind of gets overlooked. He's kind of the fourth guy he, or he really he's the fourth guy, but he's the guy we talk about the least because Wu has, has had the injury stuff and he's had, you know, the durability concerns. So we spent a lot of time talking about Wu and obviously Castillo, Kirby and Gilbert, Kirby and Gilbert are, you know, Cy Young contenders and Castillo has been yeah. really good for most of this year. Yeah. And then there's just Bryce Miller, just kind of putting up similar ish numbers uh, in the back end and nobody seems to notice. And the guy's just really good. And again, this is only his second year. Uh, in the big leagues. And that's yeah. kind of the other thing too, about this rotation. You not going to have to replace any of these guys anytime soon. If you don't want to like yeah. Gilbert's here for another three years after this year, Kirby's here for another four years after this year, Miller and Wu's here for another five after this year, Miller's uh, here for uh, I think five, I think he's just under super two. So uh, he's here for another five. And then you have Castillo for under contract for another three, I believe. Uh, so he, he's probably the guy most likely to go, uh, anytime soon. So yeah, it just, you have this rotation. They're really good right now. There's still upside for them to go get better and they're controllable. They're controlled for, uh, together for at least the next three years. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, there's, this is, you know, this is what you wanted to build. This is the whole point of, of, you know, being a run prevention club and, and drafting and developing pitching and, and the focus on like, Oh, they don't draft bats. They don't draft bats. Well, here you go. Right. Like you build from pitching and now you have this great rotation and it just makes everybody's job easier. You, you have an elite rotation. You don't need an elite offense. It'd be great if you had one, but you don't need it. You, you need an average offense. You need average defense when you have this really great pitching staff. So, uh, you know, kudos to Jerry and Justin for building this thing through the draft through, mostly through the draft, but also via the big trade. They, they, yeah, they made shout the out trade. to Scott Hunter. Yep. Justin. Uh, all Tool. Those, yep. All those scouts, all the player development and all the guys who aren't even here anymore. Uh, like uh, Max Wiener and, and um, you know, the other guys in the system who worked with these, with these young mm -hmm. arms as they were coming up and uh, yeah. you got to give those guys a lot of credit. And uh, it's, it's simply a, a insane pitching staff. Like it, it is one through five, there's a reason no team in baseball wants to play the Mariners in the postseason, And it's those yeah. five guys right there. All right. So yesterday Julio made his return to the lineup a bit quicker than I think a lot of us expected given some of the reports uh, from the last few days of, you know, people at the ballpark that had watched him run the bases uh, and it did not go particularly well. So we're going to talk about that whole situation, bringing Julio back yesterday, uh, how he looked yesterday, all that in just a moment. But first, a reminder, this episode of the Lockdown Mariners podcast is brought to you by Ibotta and FanDuel. Are you taking that dream vacation this summer, but dreading the cost? With Ibotta, you get cash back on all of your purchases so you can spend more time making memories this summer and less time dreaming about them. Ibotta is a free app that lets you earn cash back every time you shop. Earn on hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies, even toys, so you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. You can save on over 2,400 brands and shop at over 1,000 retailers, including your favorite grocery stores, Lowe's, Macy's, 
Macy's, Sephora, Best Buy, and a whole lot more. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the promo code LOCKEDONMLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back by using the promo code LOCKEDONMLB. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store in the promo code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-M-L-B. I know I'm saying the obvious here, but I love sports. I love them so much, I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, unfortunately, we get fewer games. And the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, that's L-O-C-K-D-O-N, and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And you're listening to the Locked On Mariners podcast. Once again, tomorrow you can catch all the action between the Mariners and the Tigers on the Mariners hometown broadcast with Sirius XM via the SXM app. All you have to do to find that is search the word Mariners. And uh, with the M's being in Detroit and Pittsburgh, though the Pittsburgh series is on the weekend, so this doesn't really apply. There's only one day that we're going to have to account for. Our schedule here on Locked On might be a little weird, so uh, we'll let you guys know how we're going to figure that all out. Uh, But we're going to be doing the mailbag uh, tomorrow, of course, like I mentioned earlier on in the show. So uh, be sure to head on over to Twitter. Uh, we'll put the tweet out at some point uh, by the time that you're listening to this, and you can submit your uh, your questions under there. All right, so uh, let's talk about Julio. Julio's back. Uh, he returned to the lineup yesterday in time uh, for Sunday Night Baseball. That was obviously something that he really wanted to uh, be able to, to participate in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it did not go well. Five strikeouts for Julio uh, on a day in which the Mariners offense, of course, scored 12 runs. Uh, so a bit disappointing there on that front. Uh, and and this is something that I wasn't uh, necessarily on board with, given the reports we had heard as recent as Saturday from people that had watched him run the bases, talking about how gingerly he still was cutting the bases and uh, how awkward it kind of looked uh just seemed pretty clear from my point of view and i'm not trying to play doctor here folks as some people jumped down my throat yesterday accusing me of uh but just based off of the reports that i heard didn't seem like he was right didn't seem like it was time for him to uh make his return to the lineup he looks like someone and look this was to be expected you know for someone that hadn't hit in three weeks his timing was not all the way there. Uh, now, the, the ankle isn't really something that I'm too, too concerned with uh, with regards to his ability to hit. But, you know, once he hits the ball, he's got to run the bases, of course. So that's still a big part of it, yep. even if he's just outright DHing, right? Um, but yeah, he does look like someone that, to be honest, could use a rehab assignment, but they don't want him to, to have a rehab assignment because they're worried about him. Making the the injury worse. All right. Well, at that point, he probably shouldn't be playing at the major league level either. None of this really makes sense. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it absolutely feels like this wasn't happening had the Mariners been playing just a regular game yesterday. Right. But because it was Sunday night baseball, they kind of pushed the envelope. Now, does that does that mean that they wouldn't have just gone on to do it at some point in the road trip? No, but. Still, it feels like yesterday, specifically, the reason that he was activated was just because it was Sunday Night Baseball, and I don't know if that's really putting Julio in the best position to succeed right now, and by virtue, the team in the best position to succeed right now. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, the, the all the reports coming out, yesterday about like oh julio approached the team on friday and was like what do i have to do to be able to play out by sunday and you know the 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 team has a responsibility uh to its players to say nothing you're not playing on sunday you can't run the bases like you're, you're not cutting like no this isn't going to work so uh you know there are times where teams have to protect the players from themselves uh, particularly you know 23 year olds who think that they're 
Superman and, and they, they heal faster than anybody else. And it's like, well, probably not Julio. This is a four to six week injury. Any way you want to slice it. And here you are back in three. And it's possible that if you play before we're ready to go here, uh, that it's just something that nags at you the entire year and you never get back to hundred percent healthy. And we'd rather have you at hundred percent health for, or, you know, as close to as we can get for the final three weeks of the year, than have you at 70% health for the next six. Like there's definitely a, a, a area there, a gray area where it's like, you know, you, you, the player says he's ready to go. And I, I don't think the Mariners put him out there. If they think that he could, you know, hurt the ankle more. Like, I don't think that, uh, no. there's a chance that they would, they would risk that. But, um, you know, I do think that this is obviously because Julio came to the team was like, what do I have to do to play by Sunday and all of that? And then he was activated on Sunday. Like, it just feels like, um, I'm not really, really cons- my concern really isn't about whether or not he would make the injury worse. It's about, is he actually capable of helping the team at the moment? Right. Cause you know, that's the thing is like, if he's not playing center field, right. He can't do it and he can't really run the bases. Then it's all on the bat and Julio's bat hasn't been all that good this year. Now it's been a lot better, you know, recently before the injury, but also, you know, that's, if you can only DH, if you're taking up a 26 man spot and you are a DH only for a couple of weeks, that hurts because you basically already have that in Hanniger and, and Garver. Like mm-hmm. those are two guys who you really would only like to DH if, if all things were being equal. So, you know, it, it's, to me, it's just poor management uh, decision uh, to, you know, it's a poor workload management thing because again, it, it's not just about Julio. It's about the other 26 guys on your roster who you're, you know, trying to support and you're trying to get opportunity to some of these guys are going to lose opportunities because Julio is going to be at the DH and and we'll see, you know, it, it's possible Seattle's just like, yeah, you're only going to DH every other day, but still that's not good that you're playing a man down at, on those days. Then. And, and we've talked about this, how, you know, we don't like that the Mariners essentially choose to play with 25 guys for most of the year uh, because they kind of refuse to use that last spot on their bench. Uh, and, and that's kind of where we're at now. So it's either play Julio every day and now nobody else can DH and Julio's not helping you. Or it's, you know, Julio only is going to DH two or three times a week while we yeah. try and get him back in the swing of things. And it's like, okay, but now you're playing a man down four, four times a week. So yeah. I just don't see any upside to, to putting him out there. Uh, like you said, the timing just looked awful yesterday. It looked like he was behind on the fastball. He was out in front of the, the breaking balls, which, you know, it's not that surprising considering he hasn't seen live pitching in three or four weeks. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and now it's every time it's like, hey, yeah, you took a big swing there. Like, how's the torque on your ankle? Is is that going to hold up? Are you are you going to are you going to have to, you know, come out of this game at some point? Are you going to have to, you know, do you trust your, do you even trust your ankle right now? Uh, to, to take these aggressive swings. I don't know. So it, to me, it just felt like it was an unnecessary risk. Um, it was pushing the envelope just almost for the sake of pushing the envelope and to kind of, you know, appease Julio. And it's like, you know, sorry, man, that, that it sucks. It's bad luck for you, but yeah. we got to look at not only, you know, your long-term health, but also how much impact you can help us this year. If you're playing the rest of the year at, you know, 65, 70%, I, I don't think that's going to work out well. So, We'll see. It was it was cool to see Julio back, and uh, you know, obviously, he's a big part of this, and and you want Julio back as soon as as soon as you know he can get there. But you want an impactful version of Julio Rodriguez back as soon as he can get there, because Julio just you know DHing and not you know running the bases and not playing defense, it's not that impactful. Not the way he swung the bat most of this year. So uh, yeah, it just felt like a, a big. Uh, risk that just didn't need to be made yeah it just seems irresponsible and not really with regards to julio's health but with regards to how much does that actually help the team right now right especially if he's trying to figure it out at the major league level like trying to get his timing back and all that like that again that feels like something that a rehab assignment could accomplish Mm -hmm. but we don't want him to re-injure the ankle in a rehab assignment. Okay. So then he probably shouldn't be playing at the major league level. Right. I mean, you could, so it's okay if he re injures the ankle in a major league game. Like re injuring the, the ankle is bad no matter where it happens. Yeah. And, so. you know, with the traject machine, it's like, yeah, that can, 
simulate and emulate, you know, every pitcher in the league. And, you know, you can get quality reps out of using that machine, but if that was just the simple fix and everyone would just do that and not go on rehab assignments. Yeah. Right. Like JP Crawford went on a rehab assignment earlier Mm -hmm. this year. Like he wasn't just hitting off of the traject machine and then reinserted himself back into the lineup. So the reasoning to me that we're getting from the team itself and the reasonings that for this that we're getting from the reporters that are there at the ballpark don't really add up. Two plus yeah. two isn't really equaling four to me right now on this. Uh, so, yeah, I just not a fan of it. We'll see how it goes. I mean, obviously hoping for the best here, hoping that Julio can contribute. Um, mm. But, yeah, just my uncertainty is with that. My concern with that paired with what we saw out of Julio yesterday not feeling great about the situation at the moment yeah so uh yeah uh all right real quick because i i did promise my wife caroline i would ask this uh before we got out of here she wanted me to ask you what you thought about the uh the cal raleigh thing yesterday uh that they put up on the big screen where he's dumping people oh yeah they they, they took a spin on, on big dumper with that mm-hmm. you just got dumped by the big dumper yeah. Yeah. What, what did you think about that? Caroline wants to know. Um, I thought it was pretty funny, uh, but also very clearly like a goof. Like he's not actually breaking up with these people for like, do you really think Cal is just like, yeah, sure. You want me to break up with somebody so that you don't have to for free in a very public. Yeah. That feels like something Cal Raleigh would do. Right. Maybe, maybe Cal yeah. Raleigh is a man of the people. I think he's more a man of like, Hey, yeah, man up and break up with this person yourself. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think that's pretty obvious too, because he mentioned in some of his messages, like, yeah, you should read your text. Uh, you know, we're breaking up. So obviously that that's a joke, uh, but it, it's a good one. It, it was funny. It was well-timed. Um, I enjoyed the, you just got dumped by the big dumper. <laughs> like yeah. Hearing him actually say that is hilarious. Yeah. So it was a funny bit, uh, but it's obviously it's a bit, I mean, come on. I, I'll tell this quick story before we get out of here. It's so funny to see how much he's kind of owned that name now because he didn't like it at first. I remember when I was in Toronto a couple of years ago, I was sitting in right field right above the, the Mariners bullpen. And I just so happened to sit next to a Mariners fan and he was trying to get Cal's attention to get a ball. Right. And I was like, I was like, Hey, Jerry Kelnick calls him the big dumper. You should call him big dumper. Right. And I remember the guy yells at him. He's like, Hey, big dumper. And Cal looks up at him and just like shakes his head. He's like, no. Yeah. We know (laughs) Cal wasn't really on board with the nickname until fairly recently. So yeah, uh, it's nice to see him embrace it. Um, you know, and of course, I guess we all should have known Cal Raleigh on a, on a big stage. Of course he was going to have himself a ball game. Dude, I, when, when, I didn't when anticipate I, two missiles, uh, you know, back to back at bats, back to back pitches, I believe, actually. And uh, but uh, yeah, he uh, <laughs> I already got up out of my seat when I just saw Ottavino throw the pitch on the second home run. I didn't even yeah. need to see him hit it. I was like, oh, that's middle middle. And I was like, that's gone. Like he's yeah. destroying that cows locked in. You're not going to get away with that pitch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and cow's been uh, really quite good uh, for the last month or so. Uh, yeah. so yeah, uh, hopefully, you know, people will finally start to recognize the greatness of Cal Raleigh and, uh, the dudes probably should win the gold glove this year. He's yep. thrown out more runners than anybody. He's been the best uh, pitch framer, uh, of any catcher. Like, and of course, obviously, because we know that this matters for the gold glove, he's crushing the baseball, hitting right. a ton of home runs. So like Cal Raleigh doesn't win the gold glove this year. There is, uh, we have the answer for the most underrated player in baseball. It's probably Cal Raleigh. Yeah, and he's got the uh, the fourth most home runs now of any catcher in their first four seasons. Uh, he's two behind Johnny Bench, three behind Rudy York, and seven behind Mike Piazza. So he's going to catch Bench and York. We'll see about Piazza. Yeah. Uh, um, but Cal Raleigh's doing special things right now. I saw, I think it was, I can't remember who tweeted it, uh, but Cal Raleigh is the first catcher since uh apparently mike piazza did 25 yeah. homers or more in three consecutive seasons yep uh, now piazza did it eight years in a row yeah 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 so yeah. cal's got a ways to go but uh yeah dude is dude is special and uh you know obviously and he's like he's, and he's the first catcher since like roy campanella 
that's led his team in home runs, RBI. Uh, right. I forget all the all the categories, uh, but yeah, he like leads the team in like five separate categories. And Roy Campanella was the last guy that did that for his team. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah, the dude's already the best catcher in Mariners history. It's not close, and uh, you know he's, you know, right now he's he's setting course like he might be the best catcher in baseball. Like just yeah. when you factor in the defense, the pitch framing, the throwing, the power, like if he had like a 350 on base, like we'd be talking about MVP type of stuff. We would, I mean, the national media wouldn't because he's a catcher for the Mariners. So who cares? But right. like Cal Raleigh, when we talk about like underrated players, Raleigh's near the top of that list. The dude is really good. I mean, Fan graphs agrees that he is the the best catcher in baseball. He's leading the league, uh, and or he's leading all catchers in F four this year. Yeah. He is by fan graph standards the most valuable catcher in all of baseball uh, this year with three point six F four. That's a one fourteen WRC plus, twenty six homers. Obviously, we know how valuable he is defensively, and mm-hmm. just in general, what he means to that pitching staff. The fact that he posts, despite being constantly hurt and getting hit by baseballs and playing through broken teeth and broken thumbs and all that, Cal Raleigh is awesome, absolute yep. dog. All right, so on that note, that's going to do it for our show. Uh, but before we get out of here, a reminder that Locked On has launched the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube. And now it's also available on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7 covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Locked On Mirrors podcast. For Colby Patnode, I'm Titan Gonzalez. Be sure to give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Mirrors. You can follow me at Tiding is Alice and Colby at CPAT11. That's CPAT11. You can also find all that stuff in the description of this episode. Now head on over to Locked On Seahawks to get all the latest out of training camp from Corbin Smith and the gang and tell them Ty and Colby sent you. Have yourself a beautiful baseball day and we'll see you next time. Peace.